Hello and welcome to the National Museum of Computing's YouTube series, Ask an Expert. We've had a number of questions from the pupils of a year six at St John's Church of England Primary and Nursery School, which is in Kingston on Thames in Surrey. And appropriately enough, those questions come from a class named after Alan Turing, who was, of course, the, uh, the mathematician who helped uh, crack the German military's Enigma machine encryptions during the Second World War by uh, using the, uh, his creation, uh, working with others, the machine, the bomb. Here's two of the questions we had uh, from St John's. Um, this comes up quite a lot, so it's good to get them down here for people. Uh, when was the first computer built? And follow-up question, who invented the first computer? We, it's a big question. We've actually narrowed narrow our definition a little bit to so the computer we imagined today being electronic and containing a screen and all those kind of fantastic um, concepts we take for granted but we think about computers today as being powerful electronic devices that uh, fit in your backpack fit in your laptop in the palm of your hand you can carry them around but we're talking about this era of computing we're going to go back to when we're going to frame this question comes from when computers were physically big. We're talking six meters square, which is the size of a hippopotamus. Um, they had tiny amounts of memory, maybe 3,000 bytes. And they were quite, their programming these things was not like it happens today through software. You needed plugs and switches and punch cards. Um, these really were in different times. And these were giants. Now they seem, might seem primitive to us today, but they're actually enable people to do an amazing amounts of be amazingly productive and calculate fantastic numbers at the time and be more productive and, and have more insight into what their work than before. So I'm here with Andrew Herbert. He's chairman of the National Museum. Andrew, you know a little bit about this subject. Who invented the first computer with an asterisk mark behind that one? And when was it built? There were a lot of people um, who were working on different kinds of electronic system um, just before the Second World War. The pace of that work accelerated during the Second World War and led many of them um, along a path um, at the end of which was a computer. So, for example, at Bletchley Park, um, you had um, two mathematicians, Alan Turing and Max Newman, um, they um, were the, well, Turing was involved with the, the bomb and breaking the Enigma codes. In the 1930s, he had published a paper about what a computer in the most kind of general sense could theoretically do, but it wasn't a design that had nothing to do with electronics, but it showed you that people were thinking about what could a computer be, what could it do um, in the mid 30s. Newman ran the part of um, Bletchley Park that built the Colossus machines, which are electronic code breaking machines. Some people like to think they're computers. Um, it's a matter of definition that they're, they're not as full a computer as we would think of in, in terms of a, a modern laptop or tablet or whatever, but they were certainly large scale electronic devices. Mm -hmm. And after Bletchley Park, Newman went to um, Manchester University where he set up a computing laboratory um, and was joined by a group of people, um, Frank Williams, Jeff Tootill, um, I to remember the name of the third, um, who um, had come from a radar background, and they built what is acknowledged as the first digital electronic store program computer, to put all the adjectives together. The Manchester machine was a small-scale experimental machine, because mm -hmm. that's what it was. It was an experiment to see what they could build and to test out Williams' ideas about how to build a memory. The mm -hmm. first practical computer, in the sense of one that people really used to solve problems, came a year later. So Baby was in, in 1948. In 1949, Cambridge um, had produced their machine called EDZAC, Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. There's a name for you. That project was led by a guy called Morris Wilkes. Um, mm -hmm. Wilkes had worked on radar, and from that, he knew a lot about electronics, how to make electronics work quickly. Mm -hmm. And you know, radar is a technology based on pulses. You count the delay by counting pulses. So he knew how to do arithmetic using electronics and so forth. And he'd heard um, of some ideas that had been put together by a guy called John Van Neumann, um, who'd worked on a machine that was um, developed in the United States in 1944 called ENIAC 
that again was a sort of computer, but not at that time quite in the model of what we think of as a computer today. Um, and Wiltz talked von Neumann's ideas, his, his own expertise at radar electronics, and with his team built the EDSAC. And EDSAC was um, used as a computing service by Cambridge University. And a lot of university scientists used it. Four of them went on to win Nobel Prizes because of the calculations they could do um, with EDSAC that they couldn't do by themselves. And um, those four people wrote up when they wrote their Nobel acceptance speeches, they named EDSAC as if it was a scientist on the team. Right. I think it's important. Uh, so what we started to do, there, was, there wasn't one invite inventor. There was a proliferation of people coming together. Um, I think it's important to emphasize at this point too, there was um, a sharing of ideas, wasn't there? It wasn't like people weren't holding on to this information. Um, a lot of this stuff was still theory. So being academics, they were able to, they were willing, quite willing to share their ideas, weren't they? That's right. I know they were at the um, cutting edge of the field. Um, no one was really thinking about you know, commercialization. Mm. And that's when companies start to get a bit secretive. They wanted to try their ideas out. They were all feeling their, um, their way in this very new area. So people talked to each other. Um, mm. Indeed, and Cambridge in, in the UK became what today we'd call a hub. Um, they ran regular weekly seminars and people came from other universities, people came from industry to hear what Cambridge were doing and to understand the system. Every summer they ran a, a summer school, I think it lasted a week, maybe two weeks, which was an intensive course in computers, the theory of how they were built and operated, and most importantly, how to program them. Yeah. And in some ways, the success of Cambridge, um, obviously building the machine um, was, was a very big part of it, but actually it was what they then went on to make it relatively straightforward um, for people to be able to program the machine. Uh, and that was Cambridge's, I think, biggest success was they really thought about what users needed and how to make it more straightforward than most of the other early machines. Mm -hmm. So I think an important point here is this idea of the, the computer becoming usable, not just an experimental machine or a single purpose machine, but becoming usable to a, as broad a number of as, uh, people as possible and entering what we might today call a mass market, even though that, back then that mass market was quite small, it's bigger than the handful of people in a university or a government who might have been the only you people able to use that system. Cambridge and Manchester were the first in the UK with their machines, but other universities saw them and, and realised that they wanted, um, they wanted needed computers to, to support their scientists. Um, and also business. Um, the world's first business computer was actually built by a company called Lions. Um, Lions are a, a bread and cake maker, and in those days they also ran lots of cafes and restaurants. So as you could imagine, they had a lot of data processing do, uh, to mm -hmm. do to you know, uh, get all the ingredients that they needed to make their cakes and whatever, and to send them out to the shops and to resupply them. All the kind of things we think of today as inventory management and mm -hmm. supply chain management. Um, they were doing that by mechanical and hand methods. They realized um, a computer could help in that. So they came to Cambridge and asked if they could uh, get involved in building EDSAC. They gave the Cambridge team an engineer and they put some money in the pot. Um, as EDSAC came into life, that engineer then went back to Lyons um, and they built um, their own machine, which essentially is a copy of the Cambridge EDSAC, but with additional things added that the business would need. Yeah, and also to handle uh, lots of data, so to connect to punch cards, because that was how their mechanical systems worked. Mm -hmm. And they called that system Leo, Leo 1. Um, and in fact, the, the catering company spun off a computer company called Leo um, that was quite successful. They built Leo 2s and Leo 3s and sold those um, in the market, and they were quite popular business machines in the, uh, the 1950s and 60s. So I'm going to pin you down. Um, you've mentioned a lot of computers, a lot of company names there. You've mentioned Manchester University Baby, you've mentioned ENIAC, you've mentioned Leo, uh, you've mentioned EDSAC. If we have to, if we have to, if we've got to answer this question as best we can, what, what was the first, uh, where would you say in computing history was the first electronic computer that we understand, as we understand them using today? Um, well, I think you have to give that prize to uh, Manchester because their machine was up and running in um, 1948. Um, 
but um, it was a proof of concept rather than a real machine. Um, if you actually want to give the prize to a machine that went on to be useful and had lots of satisfied users, um, that prize goes first to, uh, to Cambridge. So with all these things, it's a matter of definition. And you know, mm. in, in the world of, of our computer museum and some of the other museums and computer historians, we've kind of given up having an argument about who did what first, um, mm. because you know, it, it was a concept that was in the air. Several groups were working on it. They were all exploring the ideas. They all talked to each other and shared ideas. And indeed, Turing got involved in building electronic machines a little bit later mm. on in the, um, the early 50s. Um, and they all talked to each other and, and they learned from each other. It was a very collaborative thing because it was so new. It was exciting science. So we're saying Manchester with the uh, Manchester University baby small scale experimental machine, 1948, qualifications, yep. but EDSAC 1951, again with qualifications. Well, EDSAC started running in 49. Mm. Uh, 1951 is kind of the point at which it was regularly running a computing service for the university and have been kind of handed over as a service machine rather than as a, an engineering project. Right. Great. Andrew, that's incredible. Thank you very much for coming on and explaining, explaining that uh, detailed history for us in such, uh, I think, very really kind of simple and real terms. My pleasure. Thank you.